The first thing you should know is that this story doesn't have an ending. It stops for sure, but there is no climax to the events herein. They just sort of fizzle out. Another thing that you should be aware of is that this is a true story. Not a true story you might find on other certain subreddits that are dedicated to them, but a genuinely true retelling of a short-lived period of strangeness during my youth. Of course, some allowances must be made for the sake of narrative, but I will do my best to avoid any embellishments. This is a story of what my friend and I found in the woods during the summer of 2007, and the strangeness that surrounded those months. Geography is important for this story, not necessarily to the events themselves, but rather, their character. I grew up in a very small, rural community, in a valley about an hour's drive north of Seattle. The area is a mix of sprawling farmland, sandwiched between the Puget Sound and the San Juan Islands to the west, and the damp foothills of the Cascade Mountains to the east. Most of the strangeness that occurred during the summer of 2007 took place in the latter, but eventually spilled out into the community. Growing up in such a varied and open place has many benefits. However, the threat of boredom was also a constant. I had known my friend Sam since elementary school, and at this time we were both in our junior year of high school. We were both musically inclined from a very young age, though by high school he was much more successful at picking up girls with his guitar and singer's voice than I was with my classical percussion. Turns out chicks don't really dig the timpani. He was the more outgoing and gregarious of the two of us, while I was the bookish, introspective type. I lived out in the farmland of our valley, and Sam was living with his father in a house built overlooking a lake in the Cascade foothills. It was a bit of a drive out there, but Sam's house was also equipped with the latest tech we enjoyed. One of the few benefits of living with a bachelor father Tokens to make up for the bouts of alcoholic absenteeism, I always suspected. The area that Sam lived in was one which seemingly always avoided any successful attempt at permanent inhabitation. Attempts were made back in the pioneer days to form a community in the steep pine and fern lined bowl that the lake sits in, but none managed to survive more than a few days. Today, only a small collection of homes sit looking down on the lake, mostly retirees and an artist or two, shadowed by the large hills surrounding it. The area is perpetually wet and cold, with clumps of moss and fern growing thick and wild under the trees. This was the backdrop for our strange experience. It wasn't long after school ended for the summer that Sam and I found ourselves sitting in the half-finished basement of his father's house, playing Guitar Hero 2 and Halo. Sam was much better at Guitar Hero, and I was better at Halo. It was about 6 o'clock when we heard his father upstairs start yelling, either into the phone or at the TV, and that's when Sam suggested that we go for a walk. This happened to be the preferred method of shaking off our teenage frustrations at our parents, so I understood and agreed. We left the house and walked into the forest, finding a trail that ran along the hill. It was about 20 minutes into this walk that we rounded a corner and stopped in amazement. Standing about 30 feet ahead of us on the trail was an albino buck. There had been rumors circulating among the hunters at school about the deer, driven by a posting from the local Fish and Wildlife Office, stating not to shoot the rare deer if it was spotted. This, of course, had the opposite effect. There was now a great desire among some of the hunters to bag the deer for themselves. Laws be damned. The deer stood and stared back at us for a few seconds, before turning and bolting off into the forest. Sam and I searched around briefly, attempting to find the white buck again, but to no avail. We turned around and headed back towards Sam's house. By this point, we were pretty hungry. This incident marked the beginning of a series of strange events, about a week after our encounter with the albino buck. 
Sam called me in a rather foul mood. A pair of sheriff's deputies had knocked on his door and demanded to speak with him. They questioned him about his recent activities and whereabouts. A couple of pets had gone missing in the area over the course of the previous few nights, and one of the elderly neighbors had spotted Sam on one of his evening walks, being upset over the disappearance of their pet, and being just naturally suspicious of teenagers. The neighbor accused Sam of stealing the pet. Neither the deputies nor the neighbor could prove anything, and the pair left Sam with a vague warning against any wrongdoings. Sam saw the albino again that night. Several more weeks passed, and the pet disappearances continued around the lake. A dog here, a cat there. People chalked it up to coyotes or perhaps a mountain lion. There were whispers about things that didn't add up. A dog went missing from a locked kennel. During the times of the disappearances, there were no barks or yowls. Sam and his father often fought during this time, sparked off by his encounter with the police. As a result, Sam was often in strange moods when we spoke or hung out. I was once again over at Sam's house when one of these pensive moods struck. Growing suddenly bored with our usual video games, he asked me if I wanted to go see the cemetery. McMurray Cemetery was a diminutive old pioneer cemetery abandoned since the last burial there in the 1930s. Set back from the road in the trees, there is no sign that marks its entrance. Its ownership has long been in question, and the only care it has seen in a century has been sporadic maintenance from a local Boy Scout troop. Few in the area even know it's there, but Sam had discovered it during one of his walks. He had never taken me there, saying that the place gave him the creeps. I do not know what compelled him to take me there that evening. It took us about a half an hour to reach the cemetery, taking the same winding forest path as before. We talked about the fights that Sam and his father had been having, and the recent animal disappearances. Sam mentioned that he had been thinking often about that albino deer we saw, and even wrote a song about it. It took me by surprise when he entered the overgrown clearing as I suddenly noticed the tumbled down headstones. The entire place was thick with ferns and moss, and it smelled of damp and rot. We walked around the clearing for some time, making circles around the graves. There was a feeling about that place, something old and primal. It felt like it had always been there, rotting. It may have been the overactive imagination of a teenager, but the place felt wrong. There was seemingly no rhyme or reason to the placement of the graves, as if they had been picked up and scattered about. One grave stood out among the rest, set in the rear of the clearing. It was a crude tomb, really just a granite box. If there was once a name on it, it had long since eroded away. We stood there for some time looking at it, and I began to grow uncomfortable. I'm not one to be frightened by cemeteries or graves, but this place was different. When I asked Sam if we could go, I realized that was the first thing either of us said since we had arrived. I don't remember if we talked at all on the way back, though I do remember that my socks had gotten soaked right through the old Chuck Taylors that I had been wearing. When we got back to Sam's house, I wrung them out. The water was black. Something that I had seen at the graves had been bugging me. Some of the grass around the tomb had been recently trampled down. I mentioned it to Sam and asked him if he had been there recently. Sam told me that that was only the second time he had ever been there, the first being when he found this place as a kid. The feeling of that decrepit graveyard stuck with me for some time. I remember having night terrors about that place. Nothing specific, just a vague sense of foreboding and wrongness. About another month passed before Sam and I hung out again at his house. Sam continued to go on and on about the albino, even drawing up a tattoo design for it, which he eventually got done. 
and turned out quite well. It was after dinner that night that Sam and his father got into a proper screaming match. I hid awkwardly down in the basement, half playing Halo and trying to ignore the yelling match coming from up the stairs. Eventually Sam stomped down the stairs and said that he wanted to go for a walk. I gave some weak protest that it was starting to get dark, but Sam said that we would bring flashlights and to stop being a little bitch about it. He was in one of those moods again. I agreed to go with him. My desire to not be alone with his brooding father outweighed my apprehension about going back into that forest. Grabbing a pair of cheap flashlights, we headed out. It was dark in the trees. There was just enough twilight filtering in to make out shapes. It was the sort of darkness that seemed to drain all the color out of the world. We walked for some time. The silence broken by the occasional outburst of teenage angst and frustration from Sam. We rounded the same corner of the trail, where we had previously seen the albino. When Sam stopped walking, I looked to see what he was staring at. The albino was standing in the light of Sam's flashlight, no more than 15 feet in front of us. It looked at us for a moment, then turned and sped down the trail, with me following behind against my better judgment. We rounded another corner, and the buck was standing there on the trail, looking back at us. This continued for a few more minutes, during which I realized that we were heading back down towards the cemetery. I had no desire to go back there, especially in the dark. By the time I caught back up to Sam, we were both standing on the edge of the clearing, watching the buck bound over a wall of overgrowth on the far side. Shining our lights over the clearing, we can see it was riddled with holes and piles of dirt. The smell of rot was overwhelming. I believe I was in the middle of saying, What the fuck? When Sam turned his flashlight toward the back of the graveyard and screamed, I can still see that tomb in my nightmares. Someone had stacked a pile of human skulls, some intact and others shattered, staring back at us with their hollow sockets. They were covered in blood. Piled in a heap at the bottom of the tomb was the mutilated butchered carcasses of several dogs and cats in varying states of decay. We stood there, shocked. I remember my eyes fixating on the blood that ran down the skulls, realizing that only fresh blood could shine so bright. It was only a couple of seconds before we were running at full speed back to Sam's house. Bursting through the door in panic, Sam's father was concerned when we described to him what we saw. The police were called, and we each gave a statement. The exhumed bones were identified as some of the pets that had gone missing. No arrests were ever made, and the story was not given that much publicity. School started up not long after that, and Sam and I slowly drifted apart over senior year. His relationship with his father did improve after that night. However, the animal disappearances and deaths continued over the next few months. Spreading out across the valley, into more populated areas. That next spring, my family's cat, Skye, was found by my neighbor, cut fully in half in his driveway. The disappearances eventually stopped. Again, no arrests were ever made. The next summer, the cemetery was once again restored and cleaned by the local Boy Scouts. And since then, the area around it has been logged and cleared for new houses. I don't know if the death of my family's cat and the animal disappearances in the hills were connected or not, but frankly, I don't really care to think about it. That night was the very last time I ever went up to that lake and the shadowed foothills of the Cascades. Hey everyone, my name is Dennis Blaze. I was around 17 when this happened. And to give you an idea of how long ago this took place, I am now 43 years old. I grew up in a small town across from Seattle during the late 90s. At the time, 
There was maybe a total population of 6,000 to 7,000 people. The town didn't really have a whole lot of things to do. One night I was hanging out with my three friends, who we'll call Gary, Mark, and Rob. We all got bored of just sitting at home, so we decided to go for a drive. We stopped to eat at a McDonald's before continuing our aimless endeavor. We had been driving for about 15 minutes after we left the restaurant. It must have been about 10 p.m. at this point. My vehicle was a 92 Ford Probe. Mark rolled down his window. I didn't think anything of it at first. I just figured he needed some air. We were descending a large hill when I saw a pair of headlights in the distance. The lights got closer and I saw that it was a semi-truck but it wasn't hauling a trailer behind it. As the semi-truck was approaching, I could see Mark sitting forward. I wasn't sure what he was doing. I then saw him throw something at the truck as it passed. What the hell are you doing? Relax, it was just a sweet and sour packet from the nuggets. I was annoyed, but I didn't think anything would happen. We got to the bottom of the hill when I looked into the rearview mirror, I could now see the headlights from the semi-truck barreling down the hill, rushing directly at my car. Holy shit. Everyone in the car turned around at once. Um, I think he just pissed him off, Mark. I quickly found a driveway to turn around, then raced back up the hill as fast as I could to gain some distance from the semi-truck. When I got to the top of the hill, I turned off all my lights, and everyone in the car told me to turn down this side road that was pitch dark. I could barely see a thing, but I decided to go for it. I then turned the car back around before putting it in park. We thought it would be a good idea to wait for a few minutes before heading back to my house. We waited for about two minutes, when we saw those damn headlights coming in our direction. I couldn't believe it. The truck driver must have seen us turn down this road. I thought for sure we had lost him. The massive truck seemingly blocked our only way out. It came to a full stop. We then heard the driver's side door opening. Soon the driver was illuminated by his own headlights. This man looked huge. What the hell should we do, Mark? You're the one who got us into this shit. What do you think we should do? Let's get the fuck out of here. I don't think I have enough room to get around him. No, that's not true. On the left, there's a clearing. He's not hauling a trailer, so if you floor it now, you should have just enough room to get around him. I decided to trust Mark and stepped on the gas pedal. I narrowly missed hitting the man. I remember him angrily shouting at us as we zoomed past. We clearly fucked with the wrong guy. Who knows what he would have done if he got his hands on any one of us. Mark turned out to be correct. I had just enough room to make it out of there, and I floored it all the way back home. My parents were at the casino that night, and they weren't going to be home for at least a few more hours. We locked all the doors and closed the curtains, checking every couple of minutes for any headlights. When we were convinced that we were no longer in danger, we all had a good laugh about the whole situation. It was crazy. I told Mark he's no longer allowed to eat chicken nuggets again. I'm glad we all made it out of there safely. But I'll never forget the fear I felt when I was staring down those headlights on that dark road. This happened when I was in 7th grade. For context, I was with a group of friends whose names are Grace, Wes, Greg, Alex, and Gabe. It was a sunny Friday afternoon. Our band teacher gave us a free day to do whatever we wanted. So we decided to hang out on the steps that lead up to the music room. At the time, the local high school was having a field day at our school. This was a regular thing. As we were talking, we saw some of the high school students start walking into the gym. Among them was one kid who was wearing all black. As he walked past us, he flipped us off. <laughs> What's your problem? 
Did Agent Smith ghost you today? We all laughed and gave him the bird. We then noticed a tiny bag of white powder by the guy's feet. He just kept walking and disappeared into the gym. Now, there have been multiple instances where students have been busted with drugs. Our group stays away from them. But at the same time, we were curious as to what exactly was in the bag. At least I was. So I stepped a bit closer, and my friend Grace pulled me away. Kaylee, just stay away from it. Who knows what the hell that is? We should just go tell the band teacher. Would you relax, Grace? I wasn't going to touch it. I just wanted to look at it. But you're probably right. We then looked at the guys, and they proceeded to do what Grace and I decided not to do. Ugh, those idiots. They might get in trouble over this too now. We were about to go inside, but were stopped when my friend Alex began freaking out and acting weird. He started violently coughing and sneezing. A few seconds later, he stops and begins to act like nothing happened. This entire situation was bizarre. Let's recount what has happened so far. We get flipped off by Darth Edgelord, who drops a baggie of white powder. My friend Grace stops me from examining the bag. My friend Alex picks it up and apparently inhales it, which causes him to have a violent reaction, but then tries to play it off. That's where we're at so far. Alex then began to smile and walked right past us, heading inside. Before we left, we told the band teacher what happened. He said that he would inform the front office and then told us to keep this under wraps because around here, rumors spread fast. After that, we left the music room and continued on with our day. Now, I only had that one class with Alex, so I didn't really know what else he did until later. Gabe told me that Alex had a creepy smile on his face for the remainder of that day. It reminds me of that old story about the smiling man. It was so noticeable that the teachers became uncomfortable and kept asking him if he was alright. The smile he had looked like a normal, genuine smile, but was severely out of place. Let's be honest, there is very little reason to smile like that in a classroom of a middle school. Gabe told me that Alex made everyone in the room feel uneasy like that sinking feeling you get when something terrible is about to happen. Later on, when school let out, I saw Greg, Gabe, and Alex standing at the bus line. I went up to them. At this time, I was unaware of Alex's strange behavior. I was chatting with Gabe and Greg. I look over and see Alex standing perfectly still, looking directly at the sun, not listening or paying attention to us at all. You know you'll damage your eyes like that. None of us have ever seen Alex act like that. Gabe chimed in. Hey, are you okay, Alex? Ever since you took a whiff of whatever was in that baggie, you haven't been acting like yourself. We told the band teacher about the bag. What did you guys do with it after we left? Uh, come to think of it, I don't know. We all just kind of left after that. Alex, do you still have it? Alex ignored Gabe's question and continued staring at the sun. I tried my best to get his attention by saying his name over and over again. Alex. Earth to Alex. Dude, what the hell is wrong with you? You aren't yourself right now. You're looking directly at the sun like it's playing a porno or something. Alex didn't respond to anyone. He then slowly averted his eyes to us looking at us with his wide, unblinking eyes, then smiled. It looked like something from a horror film. He then turned in the direction of his bus and began walking, and soon disappeared, leaving the three of us dumbfounded. Well, that was fucking strange. I hope he's alright. We all said our goodbyes and headed home for the weekend. On the following Monday... I was working on an assignment when I happened to glance out the window for a second. 
I saw the police in a canine unit in front of the school's building. I was staring at the scene for a few minutes. So was everyone else. That's when I heard the intercom. <clears throat> Attention. Will Kaylee, Grace, Wes, Greg, Alex, and Gabe please report to the cafeteria immediately? I had completely forgot about the incident that happened on Friday. Until I was literally heading toward the cafeteria, the first person I saw was the band teacher. He was standing right next to the principal. There were some other staff members and a police officer present as well. The band teacher looked pissed, which was odd. He was usually a pretty chill guy who never got mad at anyone. When I saw the angry look on his face, it shocked me. I then walked over and sat next to Grace, and we waited for the rest of our friends to file in. Alex was among them, and he had returned to his normal self. When everyone got there and sat down, all the adults in the room just stared at us. I felt like we were about to face a firing squad. And the principal finally spoke up. It has come to our attention that you kids found a strange substance on school grounds near the gymnasium. Is that correct? We all looked at her and nodded. I see. Well, in that case, I would like to know what happened from your point of view. One by one, we were taken into a separate room and questioned. We all told her the same story. After she was done with her interrogation, she then thanked us for the information and then left with everyone else, except for the band teacher. All of us looked at each other in confusion, not knowing if we were allowed to head back to class or not. The band teacher then spoke up in a very angry tone. One of you didn't listen to me and proceeded to talk about this with the other students, and I want to know who. All of us were taken aback. We had never seen him angry before. I know that I wasn't lying, but it's possible that somebody else was. It's also possible that somebody outside of our group overheard us talking about this and began spreading rumors to other students. So as you probably already guessed, Alex was acting strange that day because he had inhaled the substance when he opened the bag and he was basically smiling like a weirdo and tripping for the rest of that day. To this day, none of us know what it was, but we are certain that kid who was wearing all black was involved. I still don't know if he accidentally dropped it or left it behind on purpose. Alex claimed he left the bag on the ground after his coughing fit. As far as I'm aware, the police never recovered it. Last year, I spent Christmas at my father-in-law's place. He lives in South Jersey, in a pretty remote area just north of Bryan State Forest. It is peaceful and quiet out there, but has always been a bit eerie for me. But I felt especially weird with the overcast weather and unseasonable warmth we were having. We did Christmas dinner at my brother-in-law's and got back pretty late. Because of the heat, we slept with the bedroom window open. I woke up in the middle of the night to use the restroom, and as I was drifting back to sleep, I heard a loud wail, building in volume for a few seconds, before stopping abruptly. I figured it was just an odd sounding bird, and tried to go back to sleep, but it happened twice more over the course of five minutes. I basically tried to put it out of my mind and go back to sleep when I heard a loud, shrill blast like an elephant's trumpet. At that point, I shot up. My heart was racing. I knew I had to close the window, but it took a few seconds for me to build up to it. I dragged myself out of bed and peeked through the shutters before I reached to shut the window. Whatever was out there had tripped the motion sensor light at the back of the property and was half illuminated, standing maybe a hundred feet from the back door, right at the tree line, was a cloaked figure with its head partially uncovered. 
The bottom of its face had a flat appearance, like the back of a dinner plate, with another smaller black circle at its center. I immediately slammed the window shut and didn't move. The figure just stood there, with its face tilted toward the window. I shut the blinds and crept back into bed and basically hid until the sun came up. I didn't hear any more sounds after I closed the window. I only dared another look after dawn, but the figure was gone by then. I then managed to drift back to sleep for a few more hours. I've done some research, but I couldn't come up with anything. Has anyone ever seen anything like this, or know what it might be? This is a story that my dad has shared with me. He grew up in a small town called Stowe in Ohio, with his parents and older sister. Across the street there was a boy named Richard. He was around the same age as my father. He described him as a scrawny, red-headed troublemaker. He would spit on people as they walked by, and even set a house on fire in the neighborhood, then blamed it on a kid who had special needs. Nothing he did as a child, however, would compare to the crimes he committed when he was only 19 years old. My dad had just started his sophomore year of college when he heard the news. Richard and his friends, Clinton and Kenneth, were throwing rocks off of a local bridge onto the interstate below when one of them struck a vehicle of 21-year-old Wendy Alfarendo. Her friend, 20-year-old Don McCreary, was also in the car. They were sorority sisters who had just gotten off of work. At this time, Kenneth decided that he had enough and went home. This is when Richard and Clinton came up with their evil plan. Both of the young men approached the girls, offering them help and to give them a ride. They drove the girls to a nearby shopping center where they would call their parents. However, Richard and Clinton tied the girls' hands together and drove them to a field behind the mall where they were assaulted and tortured for three grueling hours. They would abandon their bodies in that field. They then decided they wanted to sell the girls' clothing and jewelry to make some extra cash. When Richard couldn't find a buyer for the items, he burned them in his backyard, which woke my grandparents. My grandfather called the police to report what he thought was yet another neighborhood disturbance from Richard. The police gathered the evidence, and after locating Wendy's abandoned car, they arrested Richard and began the investigation. Both Richard and Clinton were arrested and charged with the murders. They found the knife that was used in the homicide in Clinton's pocket when he was arrested, and some of the burnt items still had traces of the victim's DNA. Since Clinton was only 17, he was spared the death penalty and is currently serving life in prison. Richard, however, was given the death sentence. On October 14th, 2003, at 10 a.m., Richard Wade Cooey was executed by lethal injection. Wendy's family was present at his execution. Every time I visit my grandparents' house, I look across the street to where Richard used to live, and I can't help but get the chills. I'm glad I never met Richard, and I'm also glad that my dad was smart enough to stay away from him when he was growing up. At the time of writing this story, I'm 21 years old. I'm a female and I grew up in Ohio. This was one of the scariest nights of my life and I'm still afraid to drive alone at night. At the time of this story, I was moving from a very well-known suburb outside of a main city to a small farming town with my family. My parents have never been the city type. They had both grown up on farms in the south, and our whole family have lived in similar areas until I was about to enter high school. So you can understand how itchy they were to get back to their roots. I am the youngest of four, 
I have three older brothers, and I was the last to graduate. So the summer after my senior year, my parents decided this was a good opportunity for a change in scenery, since I was no longer tied down to a school district. The town that we were moving to was only around 45 minutes away, and instead of moving everything all at once and overwhelming ourselves, my parents opted to have us move our things every few days for around two or three weeks in the hopes that it would be easier for us to settle into the new house. The majority of the drive between the two towns is through main highways and was pretty much a straight shot. That's why this night was so terrifying, because I had made this drive nearly 50 times before this. I was too comfortable and I allowed myself to let my guard down. I'm a pretty small girl, around 5 foot 3 and about 140 pounds. And even though my dad had taught me self-defense when I was younger, I'm the kind of person who freezes during confrontation or when I'm under pressure. It's very annoying. So it's a miracle I made it out of this alive. One night I decided to visit some old friends from the neighborhood that we were moving from. I would stop by on my way back to our new house. I can't exactly remember what time it was. I'm thinking it was around 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Regardless, it was already very dark outside. Now, even though Ohio is a northern state with pretty severe winters, in recent years the summers have been sweltering, even at night. I can also get a bit car sick in the heat with all the muggy air getting trapped in the car. At the time, my car's AC was malfunctioning, so I usually drove home with my windows down. As I said, it was pretty late. There weren't really any other cars on the road with me. I'd seen about 10 cars during the entire drive. When I was just over halfway on the second main highway, there was an intersection with a gas station on my right, and nothing but a river and bridge on the left. It was a four-lane highway, and I was driving down the far right lane because of a turn that I had to make further up the road. This may seem like useless information, but it will be important later on. Nothing felt off initially. As I said before, I had made this trip several times before. I pulled up to a red light at this intersection, and I was playing some pop punk music with my left arm out of the driver's side window. When another car pulled up into the left lane next to me, Looking back now, it may have been a Dodge Charger, because I do remember it was a bright orange with a thick black stripe across the top of it. I was singing along to whatever song I had on at the time when I heard talking next to me. It wasn't so much that I heard them talking specifically about me or anything, but they were being quite loud and I have ADHD, so the extra noise made me turn my head. I regretted it immediately, because when I looked at the source of the noise, I saw a man sticking his head out of the passenger side window, staring directly at me and smiling. The look in his eyes made me want to vomit. Apparently he had been talking to me. I turned back quickly, knowing that if I kept eye contact any longer, he might think that I would be interested in chatting. I then heard the sound of a hand hitting a car door. Obviously, one of the men were trying to get my attention. In the middle of all this, the front passenger started to whistle. You know, that signature cat call whistle that a lot of girls get just walking down the street. I started getting angry because I wasn't a fucking dog, but I kept my gaze forward, praying for the light to change so I could get away from these creeps. Now, I know this sounds ridiculous that we were still sitting at this red light, but this particular traffic light had those really old and shitty light sensors. The ones that you have to back up and pull forward just to set off again. I didn't give these men any indication that I wanted to talk to them, but apparently this gave them more incentive to continue trying to get me to look at them. The front passenger and two other voices piped up. Hey baby, you want a ride? Why don't you hop in? We'll show you a good time tonight. Meet us at the gas station. We're not going to hurt you. Hey, why don't you talk to us? We just want to get to know you. I had heard enough, so I rolled up my window and locked the doors of my car. Well, this apparently pissed off the front passenger. 
because before the window was up, I heard him shout, Fucking bitch! Before swinging his car door open. Before I knew it, he had gotten out of his car and walked over to the passenger door behind me, trying to pull on it. This is why explaining the specifics of my location was so important. I was basically trapped, because if I had tried to get out and go run to the gas station, or God forbid I had to run and cross the bridge on my left, I would have had to pass this other car and the man outside to get there. Obviously, getting out of the car and running would not be my best bet here, but at this point I was so terrified and I was trying to weigh all my options. Looking back, I now know this would have been a good time to get the fuck out of there, but I was literally paralyzed in fear. Again, confrontation freaks me out. I couldn't even feel my feet to hit the gas, and my hands were gripping the steering wheel so hard, I couldn't even feel them either. The man quickly realized that he wasn't able to get in, and walked up to my window, and began smacking it with his open palm. He was hitting it so hard, that I actually thought I heard the glass creaking, like it was going to shatter at any moment. When I still would not look over at him, he stopped hitting the glass just long enough to spit all over the window. I have no idea what gave me strength. Perhaps it was the fact that there was a chance he would have broken the glass and forced his way inside. But right as he lifted his arm again, and what looked like him about to drive his elbow into my window, I said fuck it and hit the gas. Running the red light, and definitely exceeding the speed limit to get the hell out of there. I don't know what made me look back, but when I glanced up at my rearview mirror, I saw that all three of the men were now standing outside of the car. I saw one of them holding a small object. To be honest, I don't even want to think about what it might have been. I almost threw up from the anxiety and pretty much cried the rest of the way home. My parents own a restaurant in the area, and are usually working very late. So when I got back home, only one of my older brothers was there. He did his best to try and calm me down, but I don't think I slept at all that night. I know the fear was irrational, because the men had not followed me home. But even so, I still locked my bedroom door, just to make me feel a bit safer. I regret not being able to get a license plate, but as you might understand, I was so shaken up and just wanted to get out of there. I have never had an encounter like that again in that area. But granted, I found an alternate route through some side streets, so I usually avoid that highway altogether. This story doesn't directly involve me. It did happen while I was in the same house, and I probably would have been a victim if it hadn't been for our family dog. Sammy. In the early 80s, Columbus, Ohio was at the mercy of a man who was known as the Grandview Rapist. When he was caught, he was connected to over 60 crimes and was suspected in at least 40 more. One of the ways that he was getting into houses was by posing as a gas reader. He would target women who were alone with children. He would enter these houses and then threaten to kill the children if the women did not comply. I don't know how things worked in other areas, but here in Columbus, during the 80s anyway, letting a gas reader into your house was a normal thing. There were lots of meters in the basement, and it was the kind of thing you didn't really give a second thought to. One day there was a knock at our back door, and a man called out, Hello, I'm here to read the gas meter. My mom thought this was kind of strange. Our driveway at the time wrapped around the house, and if he pulled far enough up, the back door would be closer than the front. So she figured that's what happened. She went to let the man in. No sooner had she opened the door, Sammy came charging into the room, frothing at the mouth and snarling. Now here's a little bit of background on Sammy. She was a black lab that we had rescued. Before we adopted her, she had been struck by a car 
and had been brought into the Ohio State University Vet Hospital. She survived her surgeries, but because of them she was full of screws, splints, and plates. Any sort of physical activity would cause her great pain. She's also the most laid-back dog I've ever met. She did not growl. She didn't bark. And she didn't really seem to care if she had never met you before or not. That was a dog who was frothing at the mouth in anger and jumping so hard at the back door that she not only pushed it closed, she actually broke the window on the door by slamming into it. All the while my mother was trying to hold her back, saying to the man, oh, I'm sorry, she's never like this. After several minutes, this guy runs off. He does not hop back into a work vehicle. He runs away on foot. It wasn't until after the man left that my mom began to think how odd this entire situation was. The man she saw was not wearing a uniform or had a clipboard. She didn't even see a name tag either, so she decided to report it to the police. The operator told her to lock all the doors and to stay on the line. Within minutes, there were a trio of cruisers out front and several more cops combing the area. Sammy was back to her normal self again, laying on her side and begging for treats whenever an officer came by. I was only two or three years old at the time, but I remember this part vividly. My mother gave a description of the man. This part was relayed to me later. It was a white male, fit, mid to late twenties, with sandy blonde hair. The officer then told my mother we owed our dog a steak dinner. He said that this suspect would stock houses while husbands were away at work, and they also suspected that he would observe school bus stops to find women who were home alone with small children, and then knock on their doors pretending to be a gas man. There was a bus stop right outside of our front yard. I wish I could tell you that there was a happy ending here, but unfortunately there isn't. It was only when I was researching this story when I came across the most chilling discrepancy. The man who was convicted for these crimes was an older black man. My mother distinctly remembered seeing a younger white man. I know for a fact that several women have been violated in that same area around the same time. It was entirely possible that there was more than one man preying on women in that same area. To my knowledge, the man who my mother encountered at our back door was never caught. Years ago, when I was still a teenager, my friend Justin and I would often go longboarding at night. My friends and I were quite the night owls. We loved the freedom of almost never seeing another soul on the road or the paths we frequented. Even when using main roads, it would still be very rare to see a car out so late in such a rural area, and you could see and hear them coming from very far away because of their headlights and the noise of the vehicle disrupting the peaceful silence of the night. We were really into it at the time, and would often ride our boards for miles and miles, sometimes not even arriving home until the sun was up. One particular night, we decided to ride a few miles away from our usual back road to take one of our favorite hidden routes. It began with a narrow, paved pathway that was the only piece of land separating two sides of a long lake. It would often sink under due to rain, and we wanted to seize the opportunity to use it before it rained and went underwater again. It was roughly two miles long. Because of the scenery, it was very relaxing to drive through. After making it to the end, we decided to continue moving and turned into a nearby path that leads directly into a densely wooded wilderness preservation. As we came up the first hill, we looked down at the bottom into the blackness. We both noticed what appeared to be a tiny, moving ball of dim light down there. It moved strangely, and it was extremely difficult to make out what it was. Rather than shine our flashlights down, we curiously watched it for a few moments, whispering to each other about what it could possibly be. 
All at once, that small beam turned into multiple blinding lights, overwhelming our senses that had become accustomed to the dark and silence. Acting purely on fear, we instantly turned around and ran as fast as we could, hearing yelling and revving gaining behind us. By sheer luck, we managed to run off path into a very dark, overgrown hole in the side of the hill, overlooking where we had just come from. We then decided to hide out in the natural dugout of this hill, hoping the plants and darkness would be enough to protect us from whatever was happening out there. We watched our pursuers right up to where we had originally been standing. There were four men, two on four-wheelers, and two on full-sized motorcycles. They were yelling at each other about something, but we couldn't make out what they were saying due to the distance we had covered. We felt safe enough to whisper very softly to each other and speculated about who these people could be. Our first thought was that they might be park rangers of some kind. Although we had never seen one out here in the many times that we had been through. And honestly, we doubted this county even had the budget or desire to have anyone patrol so deep in the woods at night. Besides that, these men were on vehicles entirely inappropriate for the paved bike trails, and they were very angry about something. They called out to us for a while, yelling things like, We know you're out here. We can see you. Come on out. We stayed very silent and decided to call their bluff instead of running. Eventually, we clearly heard one of them yell, Find them now then smashed a bottle. That erased any hope we had that these were just park rangers. We watched them split up, each of them going a different way down the series of paths on their vehicles, including the path we came from. It took us what felt like ages to even move. We were frozen in terror inside that dugout, watching the lights from the vehicles travel through the woods and pathways one of them already coming full circle and passing the point he started from. I thought about calling for help, but I was too afraid to even open my phone in fear that even the smallest amount of light would give away our location. After waiting for the lights of the vehicles to reach their furthest distance, we finally summoned the nerve to get up and try to run far enough away from these people to safely make a call. We ran as fast as we could through the woods since the headlights gave away their location on the pathways, we would hide again whenever we felt they were getting too close. The available hiding spots were getting progressively worse as the forest became less dense. The fear I felt while I waited for one of them to drive past us and only being covered by leaves and plants may still be unmatched to this day. Finally, we emerged from the forest onto the intersection of two main roads far from where we started. We ducked down into a ditch to call for help. When I opened my phone, I noticed I had recent missed calls from one of our other friends, named Connor, who we were supposed to meet up with after our excursion. I called him and frantically asked where he was. Luck was with us again. He hadn't given up on our plans despite us ignoring him, and was only a few miles away from where we were already heading in our direction. I gave him the names of two streets we were near the corner of and explained that we had to be picked up right away. He agreed and sped over to us while Justin and I waited in hiding. Thankfully, Connor arrived before any of those men did. We bolted into the back seat of his car, yelling for him to get out of there, and he took off. Relief doesn't begin to describe what I felt being safely driven home. After explaining everything that happened to Connor, we ended up just moving on with our night and decided not to call the police. We figured they would be gone by the time any officer made it out there anyway. And we would only be putting ourselves at risk as well by admitting to breaking the law by being on those trails so late at night. I still have no idea who those people were. I have been told all kinds of theories from friends and family who have heard this story, 
Some think we interrupted a huge drug deal. Justin and I admitted to each other that when the revving started, and we couldn't see, our minds both went straight to chainsaw-wielding horror movie serial killer. So I suppose it could have been much worse. Frustratingly enough, whatever those men thought we saw that made them want to catch us so badly, we never actually saw. So I suppose we'll never really know. My friend suggested I share my story on here, and I finally found the time to type it out. I'm not sure if this would exactly meet the standards of this outlet, but it's definitely the scariest experience I've ever had. So here it goes. At the time I was only 10 years old, and lived in a small coastal town in Newfoundland that is littered in large forests. Almost every house there had acres and acres of forestry behind it, which by itself was very scenic. I'm 21 now, and I live in a bustling city in Alberta. I do find myself missing the setting in my old backyard every once in a while, but it's usually accompanied by the very unsettling memory of what I'm about to recount. By the time I was in fourth grade, I was already trusted to be home by myself whenever my mother went out to visit my grandmother and aunt who lived only a few minutes down the road from us, I was happy about the arrangement. I was an only child, and my father would be gone for work months at a time, so to me I was very lucky to have this opportunity. It usually meant late movie nights and video gaming. Every once in a while I would explore the aforementioned forest, and on the night in question, that's what I was doing. I usually never went too far in, there was this rock formation I liked to climb, and once I got to the top I would look out in all directions. The house was always in sight, so I never felt scared or frightened by being there. It felt like my own private little world that I could enjoy. So as I was scaling the rocks to sit at my usual spot, I suddenly began hearing a sound from further in. It wasn't a natural sound at all. It was very faint. It sounded like someone crying. I was more puzzled than scared, since crying was the last thing I would ever expect to hear in the forest. I must have listened for a few minutes, convinced that my ears were playing tricks on me. But it was not an auditory hallucination. There was someone, in fact, crying. In my mind, I imagined it was a young girl that somehow wandered too far into the forest and got lost. I considered going back to the house and calling my mom for help, but then I was worried that the girl would wander further in and go beyond earshot. I decided to try and locate her myself. I made my way hastily through the trees and branches, trying to figure out the exact direction the crying was coming from. It definitely wasn't as easy as I thought. It was a matter of trial and error, just to make sure I was going in the right direction. One thing that never occurred to me in the moment was how consistent this crying was. There were no pauses, no words of any kind, just a non-stop sobbing and wailing that had no end. What I did notice was that the closer I got, the more metallic it sounded to me. I eventually reached a small clearing that only had a few trees and bushes. I had never gone this far in before, so this was the first time I had ever seen it. When I made my way in, it didn't take long for me to find the source of the sound. It was a gray, tape recorder, one of the biggest I have ever seen. It was protruding out of one of the bushes, and the crying was coming out of the speaker. This was very disturbing to me. 
I was expecting to find a real person. As I was about to turn it off, I heard another sound coming from just outside the clearing on the opposite side. It sounded like steady footsteps advancing in my direction. It only took seeing a tall shadowy figure coming my way to send me running. Fortunately by some miracle, I recognized my way back by identifying the rocks and trees as landmarks. This probably saved my life. I never looked back, and I didn't even try listening to hear if that person was following me. I just kept telling myself that I had to make it home. Nothing else mattered. I just had to get home. Once I saw the large rock formation I liked to climb, it didn't take long for me to know the rest of the way without needing to survey my surroundings. I was out of the forest in record time, and I immediately ran into my house, locking the door and shutting all the lights off as I went into my bedroom. I didn't want this person to know where I lived, or I would be done for. After shutting the curtains of my window, I peered out through them as discreetly as I could to see if whoever was out there had actually managed to keep up with me. I didn't see anyone, but I stayed by that window for a good hour, waiting for something to emerge from the forest, but nothing ever did. After that, I went straight to bed, and I also was never able to go back into that forest ever again. This story takes place in August of 2013 in the mountains of Southern Oregon. I'm a USAF Security Forces airman. My girlfriend was at work, and as a sweltering hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick and I decided to go explore some back roads. He is also in the military. Southern Oregon is crisscrossed with long roads, some actively used, but many are totally forgotten and sit in a state of disrepair. Nick and I spent many of our days starting on roads that we knew and looking for roads that we didn't know, driving for hours into the mountains, eventually navigating back to the paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds looming over the mountains, we set off on a road that we had never been on and began the drive. On this particular day, there were storm clouds looming over the mountains. After traveling for about an hour, we hadn't seen or heard any signs of other people in the area. We rounded a bend inside the thick woods and emerged at a meadow that was totally surrounded by aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat. Both Nick and I noticed a strange stillness in the air almost immediately. There were no birds, hardly any insect noise, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of this meadow, right at the edge of the tree line, there was a wooden picnic table. The table was very odd. It was painted a bright orange. It was much larger than your typical picnic table at a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the aspen groves was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees, as aspens tend to grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out of the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not a very tall man. I only stand around 5'5". Regardless, this table was ridiculously oversized, practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have to climb up to sit on them. As I was inspecting the table, Nick called me over to the truck. I noticed he was looking back into the trees. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of color that was completely out of place in the trees. It was a small, one-man tent, about 50 feet from the strange table. Initially, I had a feeling of dread, 
and I felt certain that there was somebody in that tent. And if we could see that tent from where we were, they could definitely see us. There were no campgrounds in this area, no people, and no main road for miles. Surely somebody camping so remotely would be, at the very least, a strange individual. However, as we observed the tent, we saw no movement and heard no sounds coming from it. Nick suggested that I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? No reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area, but we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in that tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? It's highly unlikely, I know, but the thought did occur to us all the same. After some back and forth, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around, just in case we had to leave in a hurry, and he would be waiting behind the wheel. With my heart pounding, I began making my way towards the tent. I was totally keyed up, with my senses on full alert. When I got to the tent, there were several things that struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built, and no wood was collected. The tent itself was literally full of backpacks, and I could also see women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave, intending on telling Nick what I had witnessed. As I was heading back, I heard Nick start yelling, Hey, come on! We gotta get out of here now! Having no idea why he was shouting, I sprinted back to the truck. When I broke out of the tree line, I saw an old beat-up Ford Taurus on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat, and Nick floored the gas pedal. The Taurus was occupied by two men. A third person was laying against the window in the back. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from reaching the road, but Nick maneuvered around them and accelerated towards the entrance. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we got back to the highway without ever seeing the car again. I still don't know if the person who was lying on the back window was male or female. I called the state police, and they promised that they would send a trooper out to that area. However, I received a call the next day from the trooper, stating that the campsite, the backpacks, and the women's clothing was all gone. Though he could tell that people had been in that area, that strange orange table was still by the thick aspen grove. We have not returned to that area, nor do we intend to. There's always a reason to be afraid.